Thanks, Scotty. Thanks, team. Doesn't the band look beautiful? So many good guys. Hey, welcome to church. Turn the person next to you. Say you look beautiful. Just encourage somebody. Turn to your second choice. Say you look better. Now, hey, so great to see you out in church. My name is Matt. If you haven't been to Kings before, if you're visiting, I'm the campus pastor for my campus, which is still on the Gold Coast, and we are having an incredible time up there. Before we get into the Word this evening, we've got a very special announcement, uh, which you may have seen on Facebook, but it's not every week that you start your third campus for a school. And we are Kings. We're a church. We're a school. We're lots of different things, but one of our biggest ministries is our school is King's Christian College. And this week on Friday, just gone, we had our very first open day for our Logan Village campus up past Beanley in the Jimboomba area, if you have been up there before. And we start childcare up there next term, which is very, very exciting. And we start our school up there next year. We also start our third church campus up there next year, which is incredibly exciting. And so I'm going to show you a clip from what happened on Friday as almost 200 people from the community went through our early learning center. And who knows that God's got great things in store for us as a school, for us as a community, and for us as a church up there, as families come in searching for community, searching for hope, searching, searching for Christ. And we get to be ministers and be His hands and feet and plan something incredible in a booming new area. And so watch the screens and praise God for what's happening. Come on, can we applaud that? Come on, church. How good are you? Know, as a church, we have uh, kids going to numerous different schools across the coast, but how exciting is it that we as kings can plant into a brand new area, and it's coming up soon. I know a few months ago, it was like, yeah, that'll happen one day, and we know it's coming, but it seems so far away. You know, it's like in February when someone says, Christmas is soon, and it just seemed like so far away, but yet we had our first open day, and it was so good to see everything that God has in store for up there. And so please be praying, uh, be declaring as we, especially as we start a church campus up there in the coming new year. Well, uh, this evening I have the opportunity to bring the Word with us. And this evening's message is entitled, Everything's Connected. Everything is Connected. Have you ever had a problem and then you came to realize the problem that you were seeing was not the real problem at hand? Have you ever maybe tried to help somebody or had an issue yourself, maybe an argument or a conflict or something in your business or something in work where the problem wasn't really the problem? We often call this an underlying issue or a root cause or something underlying that has popped its head out in a certain area, but the problem isn't really the problem. As some of you would know, uh, myself and a few other guys uh, are doing the Gulf Coast Marathon which is in two weeks' time, and I'm getting consistently more and more nervous as the days go past because 42 kilometers is a long way. And so we've been training for this since January, early in the year, and the kilometers have increased over the course of the year. And as they did, my left knee became, would become sore after the sort of 15-kilometer mark. And we would run and I would stretch, and it would just become sore and sore. And I've, I'm a few years younger than all the other guys doing the marathon in my team. And so I thought, I cannot get injured because I'm the youngest. Surely if there's anybody, it should be the old guys. Like they should be the ones sore and painful. I'll be fine because I'm a young male and we are indestructible. And I am, you know, immovable and I cannot be hurt because that's just how I am. And all the guys said, amen. And my left knee continued to hurt until after like six kilometers it would start to hurt. And uh, two weeks ago, I took my nine-month-old son, Luke, up Mount Warning. He was in the backpack. On a Monday, up the top, came back down, and we got to the car, and he was almost asleep. And so if the baby's almost asleep, it means that you put them in the car straight away so they sleep. Don't stop. Don't get them air. Don't try and stretch. Just put them in the car and drive, or they'll wake up, God forbid. 
And so I did that. And then so obviously after that exercise, I sat in the car for an hour and a half. And my knee was so, so sore. And so Tuesday, just gone, I bit the bullet and said, you know what, I've got to go to the physio. Never been to a physio before. So I rocked up there after work and I said, my left knee is just sore. I'm meant to be doing the marathon, but I can't even walk properly. And when I do run, it hurts. You've got to help me out. He's like, okay, no worries. So you know how it is when you're in a doctor's surgeon, they give you instructions to do. And so he says, stand in front of me. So I do. And he says, just, just do a squat. Okay, so I, I do a squat, and he says, stand on one leg and do a squat, and stand on the, the left leg, the one that's hurting, and, and do a squat. And you're just standing there going, mmm, mmm. You know when doctors do that, and you're quite of nervous because you're not quite sure what they're mmming about? Is it a, is it a nervous mmm? Is it like you need to get a knee surgery? You know, you're going to be a cripple for your life? Is it a mmm as in, I have no idea what the problem is, but I should sound smart because I'm a doctor? Like, what is it that they're mmming about? And he's just there, and he says, yes, I see. The problem is in your glute. And I'm thinking, my bottom is fine. And he said, no, no, the problem is in your glute. And, and I don't want to verbalize things because I'm not educated in the medical field at all, as my uh, nurse of a wife continues to remind me. And yet he continues to say, no, the problem is in, is in your glute. And I'm thinking, no, it's in my knee. Like, my knee really, really hurts. I can prove it if, if I can walk on it. But I can't, it really hurts. The problem's in my knee. He said, no, the problem is in your glute. The problem is your bottom. And I said, no, the problem's in my knee. He said, no, no, no. And so he laid me down and he started to treat me like pizza dough. And he was the baker as he pounded and massaged. And I very quickly learned the problem was not my knee. It was, in fact, my glute. It was, in fact, my leg. And he ex continued to go and explain that my muscles were so tight that my muscles were pulling my knee joint into its joint. However, that is explained medically. I'm not quite sure. And that was the pain because it was pulling the joint into the socket and the pain came from muscles that were further up my leg that had not retracted. And the problem I was feeling wasn't quite the problem that I was experiencing. The problem isn't always... The problem. And Steve's message is simply entitled Everything's Connected. We see this sometimes, don't we, in maybe in the conflicts that we face, maybe with our spouses or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or the conflicts that you have with the kid. Obviously, the conflicts that you have isn't always the problem, it's maybe an underlying issue. Two weeks ago, I went to my local Coles on the way home from work to buy groceries, and when I drove in, I noticed there was a car. It was an old Commodore, of course, and it was parked in the disabled park. Now, I have three pet hates. First pet hate is people that merge onto the highway going 40 kilometers slower than the speed limit. The second pet hate I have is people that wait till the very end of a lane that's ending in order to merge and then cut you off in Madraba every day. The grace of God does abound only just for that, though. Only just. My third pet hate is when... People park in disabled parking spots in shopping centers and they are not disabled because it's not for you. It's not. It's for people that actually need to park there, that need the extra space. And so I walked past. I thought, well, I won't judge because I'm a good Christian. I should just calm down. Don't judge. Maybe he is. Maybe I'm reading the situation, situation wrong. So I walked past. He's got his tall BB stubby in one hand, a ciggy in the other. There is no sticker on his car, and it's very evident he does not need to be in this disabled spot. And as all of you would know, sometimes you just need to poke the bear. Sometimes you just need to say something for their benefit, but mostly for yours. Sometimes you just need to say something for their education in case they've done it accidentally. You know, give grace, and maybe they have done it, but mainly just so you can tell them that they're wrong. And so I walked past and I said, mate, do you realize that's, that's a disabled parking spot? I didn't stop. said it very informatively. I also said it in a tone that was clearly a jab. And he went off his chops. He's at Coles at 5.30 using every expletive in the book, telling what he would do to me in very particular language. And I walked past the dry smirk on my face as I entered into Coles to buy nappies. But he went off. And everyone's there looking at this guy exploding because I just informed him that he was parked in the wrong space. And I realized that 
Look, me pointing out that he parks in the wrong space probably wasn't the main issue. The problem wasn't really his problem, and I'm sure there are a lot of underlying issues that have caused him to react in such a way. But isn't that always the case? The problem is never really the problem. The problem is often an underlying cause and what those things are connected to, if anything at all. In Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews talks about having a hope that is anchored to Christ. I'm going to explore this topic this evening. If you have your Bibles with me, would you turn to Hebrews chapter 6? Hebrews chapter 6. He says that somehow our soul and our, our being, our essence, who we are and what we do in our lives is meant to be anchored to Jesus. The writer of Hebrews talks and, and mentions how, how work, from, from work to marriage, to failures, to your successes, it's all meant to be connected to Christ. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 to 19 will be on the screen as well if you don't have your Bible. And he, he writes this, I'm going to read it in its entirety and then go back and discuss it. It says, When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what he was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. But God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may greatly be encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. I'm going to reread verse 13 to 15. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. The writer of Hebrews here refers back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, in a time where God reveals himself to a man named Abram, which he later renames as Abraham. And God makes several promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, 17, and 22. And the most famous one that we know is that God promises Abraham a son. He is currently childless at this time, which means in that context and culture, he has no heir to pass on his inheritance and his lineage to. And God promises Abraham, I'm going to work through you as a family, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you and through your son Isaac. The story goes that Abraham waits 25 years for this promise to come to pass. Have you ever had a word over you or had a dream from God or had a vision or, or just sense the Holy Spirit speak something into your heart and say, Lord, I, I know you spoke that to me, but I'm yet to see it come to fruition. Lord, the seed is there, but it hasn't germinated yet. Lord, the seed is there, but I'm not seeing any life. The writer of Hebrews here is talking to most would say a, 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 a Jewish Christian living in Rome at this time who, who have all intents and purposes just normal people trying to live their best Christian life. Their people, their mums, their dads, their families, they're, they're trying to live for Christ, but they're also just like you and I. Some things never change. They're trying to raise their kids. They're trying to pay the mortgage. They're trying to do their studies well and trying to obey their parents. They're just trying to live the good life they're called to do with the promises that God has given them. Historians would tell us that Hebrews was written somewhere between 60 and 70 AD, somewhere in that 10-year time frame. Historians would also tell us that on July 19th, AD 64, a fire would break out in Rome, and it would burn for six days and seven nights, and it would go through three quarters of the city of Rome. In that time, there was an emperor named Nero, and Nero needed a scapegoat. Ne Nero needed someone to blame for this fire that had engulfed his city. There was riots, the crowds were roaring up, and he needed someone to place the blame on to. And so he said, let's blame the Christians. And so Nero blames the Christians, and so starts in AD 64, a wave of Christian persecution that continued for decades. And so whether Hebrews was written 
before the fire or after fire, it's clearly evident that somewhere in there, these Christians, these Hebrews, are living a life that is, got this with it. There's some trials, there's some tribulations. Life isn't necessarily easy. Life isn't necessarily going the way they hoped it would. There's some blockages in the way, and the run of Hebrews comes and says to them, you've still got the promises, but it's remind, remember where they're connected to. Remember where they're connected to. They're not connected to the situation or the circumstance or what's happening in your world right now. He says, don't focus on the problem, but focus on how it's connected to a promise that stands in what God has for your life. It says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. We do this to ourselves, don't we? When someone asks us, are you, are you telling the truth? Maybe as kids, we say, I swear to God I am. I'm telling the truth. I swear on my mother's grave. Whatever you've said before. And God uses the same tactic. He says, I swear by myself. Because God doesn't lie and God's character doesn't change. But yes, he also has the ability to perform what he says. And the writer of Hebrews says, you need both and God has both. Imagine if I came to you and I said, I'm going to buy you a Ferrari. And now you may know me and you may say, well, Matt is, Matt is generally honorable, I would hope. And Matt is of his word. And when Matt says something, he makes it happen. And so I've got a tick in that box. That side of the equation is good. But the other side of the equation, you may look at me and say, well, I know he's got a family and probably doesn't have a spare million dollars in the bank account. And so probably doesn't have the ability to provide for me a Ferrari, even if he wanted to. Or maybe a business person comes to you in the middle of Rabina Shopping Center and says, I'm going to buy you a Ferrari. And you think, well, actually, you've probably got the money to do that. However, I don't know you and your character is questionable. You need both. And God here says, you can lean on my character and you can lean on my ability to perform the promise that I've spoke into your life. This first point out of this is your anchor is only as good as what it's pushing into. Your anchor is only as good as what it's pushing into. Hebrews here says you, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. The promises that we have that anchor to something. If you ever put a, a, an anchor of a boat out, you'll know that when the, the boat moves away, the anchor is therefore pushing into something. It's pushing into a bed of rock, it's pushing into sand, it's pushing into something. And the ability of that which it's pushing into is going to stop the boat from moving or if the thing it's pushing into gives way, the boat is going to move. And the writer of Hebrews reminds these Christians, reminds this body of Christ, says, remember where your anchor is pushing into, that it's pushing into God's character that doesn't shift, that doesn't change. His character that is for us and not against us. His character that wants to provide for us. And his character that wants to bless us. And his character that says, I have a plan and a purpose for your life. And by my grace, you shall go ahead. And by my grace, you should fulfill the call upon your life. And the anchor pushes in to his character, knowing that his character won't shift or move. He also says, remember that it pushes into God's ability to provide that which you've called for. Remember that it's pushing into God's ability to move the mountain or to make a way where there is no way or his ability to come in and, and, and make provision. We had a testimony of a couple of people this morning through the 21 days of breakthrough and the husband is working as a nurse and it turned out he was getting paid $8 an hour less than his award rate and he'd been working there for an over a year and so a year's worth of work at $8 less per hour was a lot of money. And he'd been asking his boss for, you know, for them to pay him his correct award. And they would continually say, no, no, no. For whatever reasons and loopholes, they just wouldn't give it to him. And so he continued to pray, continued to press in, continued to press into God's fulfillment and press into God's ability to, to shift and to change his situation. And just as the 21 days of breakthrough started, they came to him and said, we're going to make your award wage what it should be. We're going to increase it $8 an hour. And we're also going to back pay you the $8 per hour for over a year of work. And he pushed into God's ability to make a way. 
And God says in the promises of our lives, maybe it's in a marriage, or maybe it's in a relationship, or maybe it's in the university course, you're not quite sure what it looks like, or maybe the thing in your life that says, Lord, can I lean in and really trust that you won't give way? We remember his character. We remember his goodness. We remember what God has spoken over us. We remember where he found us and where we are now. We remember the thing that it's connected to. Verse 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So in the news recently, in an article there reposted from April 24th, 2013, in a city called Dhaka in Bangladesh, where an eight-story building had collapsed, tragically killing and injuring dozens. And while they couldn't quite figure out why the building had collapsed to such a great extent, engineers had their speculations. One particular man speculated that the building's foundation was substandard. And he quotes, it says most likely that one edge of the building was on much softer soil than the other. So the part of the building settled down a little bit more as the building got heavier. That could easily lead to instability, which would precipitate a collapse. Engineers looked at this building and said one side of its foundation was most likely on softer soil that caused it to lean, that caused it to collapse and sink lower in one area as people moved in, as the building got heavier and heavier, and it twisted and it collapsed. So the instability that was caused. Jesus spoke into this in Matthew 7, when he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fail, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Everything's connected. The writer here says, remember where your foundation's at and make sure there's not mixture. Make sure that your anchor isn't on one part in sinking sand and in another part on God, because a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The foundation is only as strong as its softest point in which it can sink if there's got mixture, that it causes an instability that precipitates a collapse. Everything is connected. And maybe a better title for this evening's message would be everything's meant to be connected to God. Not partially in God and partially in everything else, but everything's meant to be connected to God. The second point out of this is your anchor's hold is increased in the tug. Your anchor's hold is increased in the tug. What's your anchor pushing against? A couple of years ago, I was out with a friend fishing off Palm Beach, two kilometers offshore in Palm Beach Reef, and we were fishing there, and we were there for hours, and we got there. It wasn't my boat, so I put the anchor down, 25 meters of water, and the, and the anchor stuck. The anchor grabbed hold of something, and so we fished, and the tide went up, and the tide went down, and the boat swung around, and if you can picture the anchor as a fixed point, and the boat would simply just shift around the anchor depending on the current as they changed in the course of the day. And finally, it came time for us to head home. We had caught nothing as usual, and it was time for us to leave. And because it wasn't my boat, it was my job to then fetch the anchor. It had been on the bottom of the ocean for hours by now. And I went down the front of the boat, leaning, planking, if you will, holding this rope, tugging the hardest I could. And I would tug and nothing would happen and I would tug and nothing would happen. I would tug and I would pull and I would pull and my friend would come and he would pull and we'd both pull and we would say, thank you that no one here is watching us because this is embarrassing. And we're pulling with all of our strength trying to get this anchor off the bottom of the ocean floor, but we simply couldn't do it. See, after time, the anchor had simply embedded itself in the rock more and more and more as it tugged and tugged and tugged. As the boat pulled on the anchor for hours and hours and hours, the anchor became stronger and stronger as it etched its way in to the bottom of the ocean. And this is true for our own walks of faith, that our anchor is only as strong as the tug 
as we push on it, as we pull upon it. Hebrews says you've got a promise. You've got a salvation. You've got a future. The only way you're going to stop drifting from it is if you're anchored to the source, if you're anchored to Christ. This is where the whole, the problem's not really the problem issue comes in. It's a famous quote from Albert Einstein. He said this. He said, if I was given one hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute resolving it. If I was given one hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes resolving the problem, identifying the problem, figuring out what the real problem is, and then one minute solving it because I knew what it was and how to fix it. One commentator writes in this passage of Scripture, it says the author here in Hebrews, referring to hope as an anchor for our soul, is not simply saying that hope secures the spiritual aspect of a person, the Christian part, the part that we maybe exercise on a Sunday or exercise when we're doing our devotionals or exercise when we're reading our Bibles or doing something that many of us would describe as spiritual. He says the author here isn't just talking about that side of life, but he is affirming that hope forms an anchor for the whole of life. The person with a living hope has a steadying anchor for everything. Everyone say everything. everything. Has a steadying anchor for everything and all that they do. He reminds us that Jesus is our anchor and everything else is simply a chain or a rope that's connected to the anchor that is in him. You know how I picture it is, is often this, and, and I've grown up in church, but I've seen this time and time again, and maybe, you know, hopefully you can relate, is I think oftentimes we have the correct theology, but oftentimes maybe the incorrect method. And we have the theology that says, yes, I should have my anchor in Christ. That means I should, I should trust in Jesus and I should, I should believe in him with faith and, and, and believe that he has my life in order. And oftentimes we as Christians are very good at having that theology, but sometimes it's harder to put that into practice. And in reality, I think sometimes we have sort of these two different anchors, like two ends of a rope. And we have one anchor, and that's our anchor in Christ. And we say, yes, I'm saved. And we get a piece of rope and we say, I'm saved. Uh, I can go there. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And then we come over here to like our, like our real world. And, and this, is, this, this part of our life is where everything happens. This is the part of life that involves our thoughts and involves our, our today-to-day life. And we have our sort of different aspects, don't we? Maybe we have our, our family aspect of our life. We think, family, I love my family, I love my kids, I love my wife. This is brilliant. And, and my, my anchor becomes maybe in my family and the success of my family. And my stability comes in that success. We all, know, we all know people that have become more mature, maybe more socially acceptable once they have gotten a boyfriend or a girlfriend or become married. And then they've become normal because then they've got something to stabilize them in one particular way. Lynn is nodding her head. Thank you, Pastor Bill. And, and our, maybe our family sort of anchors us in a particular area of our life. And we have maybe our finances. And our anchor and our trust and our hope is placed in how much money is in our account or how our stocks are going or what the interest rates are like or those sort of things that, that can help us feel secure and feel like we're going somewhere in life. And it anchors us and we're not stressful because we have finances and it's going to be okay. And then we have this other, another part of our life. Maybe that's our, our success. How, how successful we are compared to all our other siblings. Or maybe how well we measured up to our parents' expectations of us in our life, in our current state. Or maybe it's our success level of the university degree that we have and the number of, of letters behind our name, or whatever that success measure for you is. And we, we, we anchor ourselves to that success. We place our trust and our hope, and this is what now defines me. Or maybe we have our marriage, maybe, or the key relationships in our life. And if they're going well, it, it secures me, it gives me hope. And maybe 
we have our, our, our dreams and our desires and those things that, that often God has spoken within us, the, the man, I'd love to do that one day. That would be incredible. The business venture, the idea, the, the thing that everyone says is a pipe dream, but you know that it's God-given. And you know God's placed it in there for a reason and for a purpose and for it to become more than just a dream, but to become a reality. And we, we anchor ourselves to that, saying, one day I'll do that. One day I'll do it. We have these almost two anchors that we have our spiritual lives over here. And we say, Lord, I thank you for it, but, uh, but I'm not quite sure how to trust you because everything else in my life is over here. And I have these two anchors. And, and, and even though I've placed my anchor in here, it's sort of just lying there and it's not quite tied on. Have you ever felt like this? The trouble with this is that often that leads to two places. Either our faith becomes irrelevant and it then has no point because it never speaks into this part of our life. I spoke to a man just a few weeks ago at our Beyond program and he said how he grew up in church but then he grew out of it and he stopped following Christ. It became irrelevant to the needs and the wants and the areas of his life. It becomes irrelevant or it becomes subservient, which means that they, they don't speak to each other, or if they do, that this area of our life speaks into this area. And our world and what's going on, our situations and our circumstances, that dictates our faith instead of our faith dictating our relationships and our future. And these things become subservient to our faith. Church isn't, isn't a necessity because I'm too busy and God will understand or, or I can get away with that little sin because, because I'm doing it for the greater good and the means justifies the ends and all these sort of things that we say when this, uh, speaking to this, and the writer of Hebrews says, remember where your anchor is formed and your anchor is only as strong as the tug that you pull on it. And through life, we keep tugging on this and we tug it and we tug it and we tug it and we tug it and we tug it. And oftentimes, it holds at least for a while. But eventually we try and go back and then we tug on this anchor and because we've just left it there, it seems to all fall apart because we haven't really trusted in the promises of Christ, but simply placed a portion of our faith and a portion of our trust upon it. Our anchor's hold is increased with the tug. What's your anchor pushing against? The third point is every gift finds its fulfillment when it's anchored in the giver. Every gift finds its fulfillment when it's anchored to the giver. I think the best way to live a Christian life isn't to have these two different anchors and these two different worldviews and these two different areas of doing life and trying to juggle our spiritual world and our spiritual time and then whatever, what everything else has, but rather realizing these things find their fulfillment and these things are good and these things are beautiful and these things are God-given but they find their fulfillment when they come over here. And God says, would you, would you lay down your finances and, and, and would you let me bless you so not even, the, 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 you're not even your, your accounts could hold how much I'm blessing you? And would you, would you allow me to take your de definition of success, which is so incredibly tiny compared to what he says, and all you can imagine and dream of, I've got even more in store for you. And he says, would you, would you allow me to, to have it over here and you would anchor it in the cross and see your success through that? And would you succeed? Would you allow me to see your, your dreams and your desires through the light of the cross? And would you allow me to see every single glory and its beauty? And would you allow me to fulfill it and make it whole? And we place it there and then we get our rope and we tie it around the cross and we put it there and we believe and everything God's called us to, but it's anchored to the cross and the promise of Christ. That we push into his character, we push into, push into Lord, have good things for me, and we push into, Lord, you can actually do it. Because if they're two different areas, we say, Lord, my marriage is on the rocks, but it feels so separate to you. Whereas if we say, Lord, my marriage is in Christ, and we look at this, and it comes in that grace, and it comes in the humility, and it comes in the blessing, say, Lord, I'm anchored to you, and you have the ability to fix this. Or we come to him with our addiction or with something we're struggling with, and we and say, Lord, we can see it in the light of your goodness, in light of your character, in light of your ability, and every gift that God gives us comes to fulfillment in what God has for us. If we have the worship team, everything's connected. 
It's a way of saying, would you allow me to bless you more than you could ever imagine? Would you allow me to be the source of the promise and the giver of the promise and the fulfiller of the promise? And all you've got to do is remember where Chris is. Remember where your trust is. Remember where your hope is. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. A number of years ago, when I was the boy, I remember my dad and I made this yabby pot. And it was this net. And if you've, seen it, if you've ever seen a crab pot, it was like that, but it was smaller and it had a metal ring and it had a mesh. And I found it in a book and I said, Dad, let's make this. And we spent hours making this yabby trap that we would eventually walk down a pier and drop it in the ocean with bait and catch yabbies. We spent so long trying to, to make this and it came up and it was incredible. I remember holding it with such pride and fulfillment because I've made it. And if you've ever made something or made something for yourself or gotten the promotion or done a great job or said, I've done this, and I took it to the end of the pier and I had this rope attached to it. And I remember dropping it in the water. Bloop. And it dropped and I held the rope in my hand, watching it go down. And this is when I got some yabbies. I'm like grade three, grade four. This is the best day of my life. This is, this is awesome. And I held it and I held it and I held it and I held it. And I'm waiting for it. And then I look. And I realized that I didn't tie the end of the rope to anything. And I turned around and said, Dad, Dad, I think, I'm not sure where it's gone. I'm not sure what happened to it. Dad, Dad, come and fix it. And my dad came over and said, where's that yabby trap that we spend hours making? It's down there, Dad. It's down there somewhere. He said, did you not tie the end of the string to anything? You realise things sink in water. And my dad is a legend because I remember vividly him being like, well, that's a shame. And then we spent the next several hours fishing in that particular area, trying to get it on the hook to lure it back. I think oftentimes we can do this in life, can't we? We come and we say, look what I made. This is incredible. And it is. And God's like, you're a genius. God's like, I, I made that brain that, you know, you thought of that thing and you made that company or that business or that acquisition or you made study or that exam or that paper. Or, you're a genius, my son. And we're like, yes, God, I am a genius because you made me. And then we, we drop it in and we, we use it for everything it's called to. But who knows, oftentimes we, we do it and we just forget to tie it off before we drop it, before we use it. The Hebrews writes to a group of ordinary people and, and says, reminder, says, hey, on a sec, guys, you've got some promises, you've got some hopes, you've got some dreams, and they're going to come to pass. All you got to do is remember where they're tied off to. Remember they're tied in Christ. Remember they're tied into God's character, into His ability, into what did for you on the cross. And the writer of Hebrews finishes off with saying in verse 20, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. The word forerunner here was a sailing term used in first century Israel where they would have a large ship that would go from place to place, but it was too large to go to shore. So what they would do is they would anchor into a smaller boat, into a tender, if you will. And the smaller boat had the ability to get through the breakers, get through the waves and get to shore, carrying the anchor from the large ship and place it in the sand and bury it so the ship couldn't float away. That was, the, that was the boat that would do that. And Hebrews says, Jesus is our forerunner. He takes the anchor of our lives and he places it in God's character and in God's ability. But it's through Christ. It's by grace we've been saved, not by works so no one can boast. Says Paul to the Ephesians. Church, could we stand to our feet?